Robert Philip. He finished his residency program in Alexandria University of Washington and, and he got his award in the Master of Science for by the MD. because it's uh, already uh, four o'clock in the morning here in, uh, in Sydney. Um, um, uh, I'm ICO fellow at Zur Hunter Hostel. It's a um, um, tertiary care center um, 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 north of Sydney, um, in Newcastle area. Um, um, I've been asked to prepare this presentation about clinical presentation of COVID-19. Um, and my objectives um, for um, the lecture are going to be going through some definitions and um, how COVID-19 being transmitted. Um, <clears throat> then I'm going to go through how we screen and how we triage um, suspected cases of COVID-19, um, um, the clinical presentation um, and course of disease and um, a bit about prognosis and bus, uh, um, prognostic pathway. Um, <clears throat> As an ICU uh, professional, I think it's a um, um, very unprecedented um, um, time for all the intensive care services. And I think what we're facing is um, uh, how to plan for a pandemic, um, how to uh, provide a um, very safe environment um, for yourself and for your colleague, um, and how to sustain um, uh, the safety during the pandemic and during this chaos. Um, then later on, how to identify and how to treat um, your patient. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, Australia is not um, very uh, uh, well uh, supported by the ICU beds. Um, so normally, we had a nine ICU bed for every uh, 100,000 uh, population. Uh, however, uh, in the last uh, few weeks, we've been doubled the ICU bed um, from 2,000 to almost 5,000 ICU bed in um, uh, interstate. Um, so, um, as we all know, um, it's an outbreak happened last year in December um, in Wuhan. Um, they were able to isolate the virus, and it's one of the beta coronavirus um, in the same family of SARS, um, MERS CoV, and SARS um, CoV one. Um, and COVID-19 is simply a respiratory tract infection caused by COVID, um, uh, by SARS-CoV-2. Um, so um, to go through definitions, um, first, which case you can say it's suspected case. Um, and um, my definition is um, mainly depend on our uh, health care uh, network. So it might be differ, um, vary or different from, from us uh, to you, to the WHO. So um, we actually um, suspect any case with acute respiratory illness. So anyone with fever um, plus any sign or symptom of the other respiratory tract um, symptoms like um, um, anyone with cough, um, chance of breath, um, expectoration, um, they are highly suspected um, COVID patient. Um, if he also, if he had a history of travel in the last 14 days, or if he lives um, in an um, um, area which is reported as a community transmission um, area, uh, anyone who uh, be in contact, in, in contact uh, um, with a COVID, with a COVID um, um, probable or confirmed case, and we also, um, anyone who hospitalized with acute respiratory illness, um, we consider it as a suspected case of COVID-19. Um, there's also a term we use as probable case, and it's um, really a vague term, but we use it for anyone who highly suspected and we uh, couldn't do the test for whatever reason or test is inconclusive. And also we used it for um, a very highly suspected um, patient who uh, had a first test is negative. So we've seen a couple of cases with um, community acquired pneumonia, typical pneumonia, um, and you, you do the first test, it's negative, and second test is positive, or third test is positive. As we all know, uh, the sensitivity of the test is um, 60 to 80, 
maybe 70% on average. Um, so we've, we've seen a couple of patients with uh, being positive in second or third uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. And confirmed cases, a laboratory confirmed case, uh, case. so um, irrespective of uh, clinical, so might be have a clinical symptoms or no, or asymptomatic completely. Um, to say it's a contact, you have to be in, to be in um, a very close uh, proximity, um, at least than a meter, and you have to stay in the same proximity for uh, 15 minutes. Um, if you have a direct physical contact, like shaking a hand um, or examining a COVID patient, without a proper BE, or if you looked after a patient who is being confirmed as, um, as a COVID without uh, wearing a proper BBE, um, you consider a contact. And contact, we isolate all contact for 14 days. Um, as Dr. Mahdi said, and um, uh, my, my other colleague, um, um, transmission is mainly through droplets. Uh, it's really overwhelmed information, um, but as far as we know now, it's mainly droplets, it's infection, um, and it's large particles. So large particles cannot sustain in air, so it drop down into a surface and settle in the surface. Um, and once it's once in the surface, someone else come and touches the surface by direct contact, like by his hand. Then by his hand, he touches his mucous membranes, either mouth, nose, or eyes, and he contracts the, the disease. Having said that, um, it's evident with aerosol generating procedures, um, people can propagate and generate um, very small particles, less than five microns, which can <coughs> travel for longer distance, up to six feet, and it can it can really settle and uh, stay in air. And in very recent publication. Um, um, to study um, the survival of um, SARS-CoV-2 um, in different situations and in different services. Um, and um, with aerosol generating procedure, you can um, still have um, an viable viruses uh, in the air up to three hours. Um, and if um, large droplets sit in the surface, it can stay up to 72 hours in the, blast in the plastic surfaces. And also in the steel, the sand steel surfaces can stay up to day, up to uh, 48 hour or up to two days. So it's a pretty, um, pretty unexpected. Um, if you don't wash your hand frequently, you may open a door. Someone who opened that door two days ago and he was infected with COVID and he still got the disease. Um, as uh, my colleague said, the aerosol generating procedure is a long list of procedures. Um, it can be a very simple procedure like just a child is streaming or screaming um, or someone sneezing uh, or use nebulizer. So just nebulizer can um, generate aerosol. Um, blazing an NG is also, uh, we consider it in our area as an um, aerosol generating procedure. Um, invasive procedure like intubation, extubation, bronchoscopy, tracheostomy, Doing, doing CBR, yes, uh, we consider chest um, uh, massaging or um, um, chest compression as an aerosol generating procedure. <clears throat> and and uh, in our Australian um, Resuscitation Council, uh, we used um, a D uh, before ABC, we use a D in ALS and um, uh, in uh, BLS. And D stands for danger. So if, if there is a danger, you cannot go and assist airway and do breathing and do breathing and circulation. So we consider it as a danger uh, for yourself and your colleague if you jump in and you do chest compression and you do an aerosol before putting a BBE. Yes, it might compromise patient, uh, but um, you're gonna harm yourself. So it's D, it's danger uh, doing um, chest compression prior um, having a proper BBE. And um, IC, putting ICC even here, we consider it an aerosol generating procedure, which has, which is sound very, very silly for me. Like last night, I got an tension pneumothorax in ED, and I've been asked to take the patient to, um, to the unit to put an ICC because um, uh, they run out of uh, negative pressure room. Uh, high flow is a bit of debate um, to, um, is it an aerosol generating procedure, but we consider it as an aerosol generating procedure and in IV as well. I think anything can
skin glow. And if you have not well fitted mask, you definitely gonna gener generate an aerosol. And you definitely need an a negative pressure room with HIPAA filter to be in to, to manage the patient in um, if you're gonna use one of those. So in my unit, we um, we we um, we don't have too many um, uh, negative pressure rooms. So usually we admit the people to a negative pressure room to start with, but if they if they reach a state of intubation, uh, a post intubation, we move them to a single room, in in uh, in a COVID cohort ward, I see I see you both. Um, they are single room, a single isolated room, but they are they are not negative pressure rooms. Um, so moving into incubation period, as we all know, incubation period is a period between exposure to infection and the first clinical symptoms. So WHO stated that the median incubation period is five, six days, and it ranged from one to 14 days. However, uh, there is a lot of reported cases of longer incubation period, uh, up to 24 days, uh, but most likely they are statistically outliers, and um, the explanation might be um, first exposure was a, a false exposure, and you get um, between first exposure and first symptoms a second exposure, which was a true exposure. So virus shedding, um, people who um, didn't survive, um, they were shedding the virus up till, um, till, the, till they died. Um, and in survival, the, the longest virus shedding was 37 days. So it's a pretty, pretty um, very long, Time. So if you thought about it, shall we isolate everyone for a 37 days, so the longest, safest time? Um, it was a bit of debate here in Australia, um, but um, to, to be clear, um, RT-PCR, which we use to diagnose, uh, to diagnose like COVID-19, um, it can't really differentiate between a live viable virus and or just um, um, a virus particle or just RNA segment. So um, there's a famous um, studies before show that the people who had influenza vaccine, if they swap them, they can, you can find a positive um, BCR sometimes. So, so they might, they are positive, um, but uh, might be just an uh, RNA segment, not a viable virus. Um, how we screen people here in Australia, it might be different from you guys, but we, um, we established what we call COVID clinic. So every host had a, had a COVID clinic. We also um, had a community center or a private center, um, like we dedicated a medi private medical center to be only a COVID center. And, and usually um, people are very well educated. If they have the symptoms, they got a number to call and you'll be directed to, um, depending on your location, to be directed to one of the COVID clinic. It can be in hospital, it can be in um, a private medical center. And um, the same number also they will alert to the clinic that someone is coming to you, his name is so-and-so. Um, he's gonna be in your clinic in an hour or so. So this is our, our clinic in John Hunter, um, my hospital. Um, so we got a triage nurse um, 24 seven. And you have to wait in line if you're more than one patient with a social distancing distancing of two meter. And to, um, you, when, when you um, reach the queue, the ring, you really have to ring the bell on the left. And after you ring the bell, the nurse is gonna be ready with full um, BBE. Um, and it hands you direct a surgical mask and you have to wear the surgical mask immediately. You get in the clinic and um, you, 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 start to, you examine, uh, so the third nurse, there, there are, most of them are AD nurses and they do a um, very good job in triaging them. And um, they, have a, they do a need of an angel swab. Um, they clinically examine them, they get their vital sign, um, they get their oxygen in room air, um, and they get also serum. I think this takes serum for antibody. It's just a, some sort of um, research tool not, not to diagnose anything, but they, uh, they are now working in the, um, they to test the serum for um, COVID-19 antibodies. Um, if you've been uh, impatient, uh, they usually they write in the sample, it's impatient to preferize uh, screening. We run a screening test every four hours. So if you are an impatient, you will be very, um, uh, pretty much 
um, uh, first priority to be to, to your test to be run. Otherwise, you can get your test in 24 hours or, or um, 48 hours. Um, and I think the main purpose of this uh, COVID-19 to um, to try to isolate and try to catch this COVID query, suspected and query or confirmed cases in 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 first contact with healthcare system. You don't really you don't really want to admit someone to um, through the triage area and the, through the ED to the ward and later on after 24 hours or 48 hour he came back positive and you expose the patient um, and as a healthcare worker to um, to the COVID. Um, so we triage them uh, to either home care or hospital care, and uh, majority of our patients are home care, um, less than 10 percent is hospital care uh, currently. Um, all mild symptoms are young are home care. Uh, we admit to the hospital anyone who requires oxygen, anyone with um, um, oxygen saturation less than 92 in room air, we admit them to the hospital. Anyone who, who um, more than um, 70 year old is an indication to be in hospital. Anyone who more than 60 year old plus comorbidities, usually we consider admitting them to the hospital. Mainly cardiovascular um, 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 history or chronic illness, diabetes, hypertension, um, some social indication as well if someone live alone, live uh, in rural area, we might consider admitting him to um, to the hospital as well. We admit all of them to COVID ward uh, if they are ward based patient. Um, it's a dedicated ward. Only only you got um, COVID confirmed and um, and board and COVID suspected uh, board. Um, um, all of this ward uh, uh, is a negative pressure rooms and some um, single room as well. So they, they are nursed one to one. Um, in uh, usually um, in room or negative pressure room with HEPA filter uh, with anti door or anti room, um, and the plan if we run out of the negative pressure room to move them to single room um, with the door shut and, and to open cohort area later on. Unfortunately, we still have a plenty of negative pressure room. So clinical presentation of COVID-19 is really a um, very wide spectrum of, clini of clinical presentation. You can have someone who had completely uh, asymptomatic and it's been um, um, uh, up to maybe 30% in literature. People in, 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 I think in Korea, they found um, they screened in contact and they found maybe 30% of population have completely asymptomatic. Um, and the other way you can you can present with um, life threatening critical illness, um, AR base, and um, multi organ failure. Fortunately, um, almost eighty percent of uh, people present with very mild symptoms, uh, uncomplicated illness, um, just flu like illness, fever, cough, fatigue, muscle ache, muscle ache, and headache. Um, and in 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 this um, meta analysis. Uh, which was um, done mainly in China. Are, uh, there are 19 study, 18 from China, one from Italy. Fever was the most common uh, presenting symptoms. It was like almost 88% of uh, of COVID most patient during hospitalization had high fever, um, and cough was the uh, second most common, um, up to 68%. Um, followed by fatigue and skeletal production, short suppress and muscle um, joint pain. Having said that, there is a, a lot of atypical presentation, um, like um, anosmia. Anosmia is, um, is also very interesting. Um, they found in this study, almost one third of the population started a complaint with anosmia. They cannot smell, and they um, uh, also um, a, um, problem in tasting. Um, and the explanation most likely is neurotropism or invading, invading, invade, a virus invading the um, olfactory um, nerve when, when it enter to, uh, through the nose or uh, nasopharyngeal. Um, maybe 15 uh, from Wuhan publication, 30% from Italy publication, um, they will have severe disease and severe disease is mainly um, requiring hospitalization, either for oxygen therapy or for um, respiratory monitoring. Um, unfortunately, only 5% um, uh, from Wuhan publication and 15% from um, Italy, they present with critical disease and critical disease 
um, is severe hypoxemia, ARDS, septic shock, multi organ dysfunction syndrome, um, acute kidney injury, and cardiac injury. Um, actually, acute kidney injury, with, um, and it's very interesting. Acute kidney injury, um, we had a lot of presentation. Now we have, like, now we have five COVID uh, intubated patients, uh, four of them are in, in CRRT. Um, and uh, I would throw a, a, a little publication, and I think it's been reported up to 40% um, of, uh, in, in, in a lot of publications, they had an acute kidney injury. Um, and majority of, of them, they require um, uh, renal replacement therapy. And that's it. the explanation of the AKI, it's really maybe multifactorial. Um, and I think it's mainly, mainly hypovolemia. Um, those people present after a week in home, then um, they are febrile, they are ill, um, they are anorexic, um, not eating and drinking. So they are hypovolemic. And all of us have the idea of dry lung is happy lung. So everyone uh, would um, give anyone with pneumonia or with short surface prismide or vitamin F. Um, so prismide, dry him more, dry him up, and he gets worsening hypovolemia and worsening acute, acute kidney injury. Uh, other explanation, um, it might be also the micro thrombosis uh, theory of um, COVID-19 in the lung, same in the kidney. You get a uh, micro thrombosis in the renal artery or, or renal vein. Um, you have three minutes, Dr. Hashem. Okay, so fortunately, kids are um, are less severe than adults. Very few kids. We admitted only two kids in, in, the, um, in our intensive care, and they are fine. They are discharged without um, in just a high flow. So the course of disease is really interesting. So um, um, in, 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 in this study, they studied 190 patients. Um, and they found fever is continuing up to day 12, day 11. Um, these people usually present to the hospital in day seven uh, after a week of being ill. And after uh, four or five days in hospital, they present to, to the ICU with hypoxemia and ARDS. Um, so uh, so also, also septic shock, they usually present septic shock at day, day, day 10, uh, acute kidney injury day 15. And, uh, and, and um, I can swear we, we, we have that typical presentation here. Um, very famous, um, Dr. Gatanoni, uh, his, his um, explanation as well for the course of disease. He will start with just viral response, um, while symptoms, fever, transitional symptoms, which are gonna progress in a week to some um, suppress hypoxemia, then flare up of um, inflammatory response in ARDS and septic shock and multi organ failure and, and, and cardiac failure. Um, I think everyone now talking about heavy hypoxia, which is not heavy at all. Um, and, and same, Dr. Gatanoni explained, very well explained, really, because we've seen typically the phenotype L and phenotype H. So early in disease, you got the phenotype L um, with um, very low elicitance which has been very high compliance, they have a very good compliance, um, and they are hypoxic. And if you, um, they, are, they are hypoxic, but mainly if VQ mismatch rather than shunting. So they respond very well to oxygen. They didn't respond to, um, to beep or, um, or proning position. But with the time, they move from phenotype L to phenotype H, with its, which is um, very high elicitance, very low compliance. It's typically ARDS like. They, and, and they are shunting more. Um, whatever gives them oxygen, they, they, stay, they stay hypoxic. And these people, they really respond to um, high B recruitment maneuver and uh, broom positioning. So risk factor, who got severe disease or not? Uh, I think age is the most important risk factor for hospitalization. Um, also, um, this was from Italy, uh, one study from Italy and a study from, um, from China. Same in Europe, uh, also age was um, a risk factor for hospitalization, risk factor for severity of disease and, and this. It's same same uh, in, in, in the States. Um, and they found a mortality rate um, of 10 to 27% in elder, more than 85. And from 65 to 84, mortality rate was 3% up to 10%. And a normal adult, 55 years and, all, and above, mortality was 1% one, one, one to 3%. 
Uh, other um, other risk factor for severity, comorbidity, so being hypertensive or have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high, um, COPD, or asthma, malignancy, or chronic liver disease as a risk factor for um, for giving um, getting a severe illness. Um, so as a prognosis, um, also being old age, um, having a higher SOFA score in admission, having a higher D dimer. Uh, in multiple studies showed a worse outcome and a risk factor for high mortality. And among the non-survivor in Italy, 75% um, almost have uh, hypertension, 33% have diabetes, and 30% have ischemic heart disease. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shem. Well done, thanks. Uh, so, so our next presenter here will be uh, Dr. Uh, Saima Salim, and he is assistant professor and Head of uh, Intensive Care uh, B unit in Ain Shams University. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Samah, for joining us in this meeting. So again, I would like just quickly to highlight the, the poll is coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walid. Uh, uh, thank you for introduction, and uh, we'll go rapidly into diagnostic testing for COVID-19 in this uh, important course. Actually, uh, as all agreed that we are living in hyperdynamic status uh, with uh, uh, changing in even the definitions of suspected cases up to four times in our country. And, uh, and the latest one in front of you is the fourth time, just uh, the end of last month, with more uh, load on the clinical uh, diagnosis rather than epidemiological history or besides epidemiological history. But all, uh, we know that the confirmed cases we have to be proved by either uh, BCR or immunological assay. Here, uh, uh, I'll not uh, repeat what uh, Dr. Hisham uh, told, but more emphasis on the uh, fever and the cough. It is present in more than 70% of cases. However, absence of fever does not exclude uh, COVID-19. Besides the uh, uh, other uh, Thousands of presentations. Uh, one of the most uh, significant one is the GIT presentation, uh, diarrhea, uh, nausea, even preceding fever and dyspnea. Unfortunately, it is not in the most of diagnostic algorithms and to lead to escape uh, of cases from the frontliners. Uh, again, COVID encephalopathy, ST elevation in mine, one case, Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome in one case, uh, silent hypoxemia or hypoxemia without dyspnea, and the two percent of patients may develop uh, pharyngitis and to right, at least don't examine. Uh, those uh, patients uh, fearing COVID. Uh, the problem in diagnosis is that the patients might come early, late with complications. Uh, that's why uh, the incubation period is more or less high, uh, might come with uh, dyspnea or without dyspnea, admission after it. The, the timeline is important in diagnosis. Also, the spectrum of disease was the patient presenting symptomatic as the uh, uh, states. Or uh, the coming in illness will be mild, severe, or critical. The uh, lab will concentrate more on the uh, uh, lymphopenia. It is present in almost more than 80% of patients with absolute figure of 0.8 or less. And the ratio between neutrophil uh, to lymphocytes, uh, if it is more than 3.13, indicating severe illness, especially above 50 years old. The dimer uh, of uh, Bohr prognostic index and the hallmark of DIC. Uh, of course, here active protein is increased. Uh, uh, BCT doesn't have role unless, uh, with uh, as a broader uh, prognostic uh, sign uh, reflecting a cytokine storm or associated uh, bacterial infection. Uh, here, patients will come with complications like acute kidney injury, acute cardiac injury, septic shock, secondary infection, all make a burden. Lab with higher mortality, elevated CRB, uh, D dimer, ferritin, LDH, thrombolin, low album with good protein. We'll come to confirm the diagnosis with lab, okay? Either uh, uh, RNA detection, uh, which is the BCR with sampling from the sputum, nasopharynx, or the nose, especially in, in non uh, hospitalized patients, or test the blood for uh, the antibody IgG or IgM. In a summit by American Society of Microbiology, they have a problem that we don't have a gold standard uh, test. The, and we have a, a dynamic status, never before experienced this, what we are living. Uh, of course, uh, Chinese played a very role uh, part in starting. Um, it is a pandemic problem. Egypt, uh, yesterday, we were speaking about almost 1,800 patients. And we have this gold standard. 
if we have it, we can test all the population and investigate those patients all over the world, asymptomatic, severely symptomatic contact tracing. If you have immunological assay, we can who is immune, who is not immune, and by that we'll control the spread of infection and beat this enemy. That's why what we have is uh, our resources is a PCR and immunological assay, and we have to uh, uh, move with uh, the current crisis closer by these two uh, studies in order to make an ideal situation, uh, especially in absence of uh, therapeutics and the vaccine. Of course, no viral culture, killing of spread, and infection of viral engine as well. Uh, we told about the PCR, uh, specimen uh, from nasopharyngeal in hospitalized patients, and from the nose non hospitalized patients, the lab immediately please, if intubated, at any time, take tracheal uh, aspirate, don't do well, don't induce this person fear of the spread of infection. Uh, also, with uh, BAL, it is uh, a uh, positivity ratio up to 93%. You have BAL sputum, uh, the highest uh, positivity, is deep uh, samples. Nasal is two-thirds of the cases. Uh, Varyngeal swabs, one-third of the cases. Nasal swab uh, contains the most of the virus. Uh, here is a, a differentiation between all pharyngeal uh, viral uh, specimen or the nasal swab with more uh, with the viral uh, as, uh, presence of uh, the virus itself, uh, concentration of the virus. Yeah. We are speaking about uh, whether it differs from being uh, uh, severe or mild. Uh, yielding is more uh, more or less the same. Okay, more on the timeline uh, section of the BCR is more with the uh, timeline. But again, deep sample. Uh, more uh, yielding. Uh, if uh, you have negative sample with the upper uh, respiratory tract, go to the lower respiratory tract sample, more or less question, question about this one by the WHO. The limitation of the BCR uh, may be not good sample. Uh, also, again, uh, time uh, of presentation, as we are telling, patients might be with positive CT and negative uh, CRP and at the time, whether you know, whether false positive the CT or false negative BCR, and here the clinical data and also the uh, serological examination might help. Uh, as regard, uh, it is uh, of course hundred percent specific CT if is theoretically false uh, positive result by contamination. Then it's simply almost we are speaking about seventy uh, percent. If it is coming in negative, please to repeat, and there is a deviation from negative uh, to uh, being a positive. And also, uh, we are coming, if negative and suspecting, okay, uh, keep isolation and again resemble, like in two days duration. The largest challenge, actually, we are facing is that we are telling all patients, we are telling all patients COVID until proof otherwise, okay? But the clinical judgment is very important because if you are utilizing this theory, there will be excessive uh, consumption of BBEs and uh, exhaustion of our resources, okay? And also, it will bear somehow the care because of the isolation and family uh, complaints against cutting the, the visitation, okay? Uh, and uh, scanning, you don't need to go to do procedure or uh, surgery or uh, CT scanning. Again, uh, rolling out few only patients, it will lead to nosocomial transmission of uh, COVID. Uh, it might be associated with another viruses or bacterial and even blood culture might help you. Most responses started by ELISA for VGM, the most of 93% of cases, clinical, radiological, uh, and epidemiological data. Here is the rapid test to uh, detect the IgG and IgM as well. And this is a graph, it's very nice graph, telling this blue line, telling about the BCR, and even started to rise, even in patients asymptomatic, but depending on the sample quality. And then IgM after three days of the starting of the onset, and the IgG may be at the 14 uh, days. Uh, here also, uh, table uh, getting put it together. BCR, IgG, IgM, FBCR, and the negative IgG, IgM, patients will be in the window of period of infection. And the, the bottom, like IgM, IgG, positive, and BCR, uh, patients may be in the recovery stage of infection, or the BCR results may be falsely negative. Here, in order to help us uh, in convergent uh, theorem, and, and only, only it is not related to the patient detection, but also for the benefit of healthcare uh, areas and public uh, health. Four other uh, mo modality of treatment and diagnostic ECG changes, it's common, ATVT, AF, uh, but the most important, we have to monitor the QT prolongation, especially with hydrochlor 
hydroxychloroquine used in azithromycin. And this is an example of what we, uh, what uh, had been observed in one patient, S1Q3PC, with uh, obstruction by a very visible secretion in the tube and the uh, surge of the uh, barmary artery pressure and coming to be corrected spontaneously. Uh, for CT, it is quite sensitive uh, technique, okay? And uh, however, the American College of Radiology is telling against the use of CT in screening and diagnosis, but it's very important to imagine for uh, Both CT, even in asymptomatic patients, up to 50% uh, and to the third, uh, third of cases in another study. And uh, it might be early phase, progressive phase, and severe phase, and diffusive phase, or subfibrotic fish, and every phase has uh, characteristics. I'm starting from ground decline to be peripheral distributed up to heavy consolidation. And also with time, with increasing time, the uh, consolidation started to appear more and more, and the heaviness of the lesion starts to more and more. Uh, after 15 days, the upper one, the middle one, is after 30 days, and after uh, eight, eight days, uh, the bottom one. Sensitivity of CT is, is very high, okay? Uh, uh, however, uh, early, with minor symptomatology, it's coming down down to 50%. But most of CT uh, doesn't mean anything. There is no any precise definition for this one because ground glass brilliance is in, in a very uh, huge amount. For shift X-ray consolidation and the ground ground, uh, ground glass opacities uh, uh, mostly present, and but uh, sensitivity is less than, of course, the uh, CT. Uh, and this is the first case of uh, uh, Indian patients. Uh, and this CT and the X-ray showing how much uh, the affection and the density. Uh, for ultrasound, it's very important. It's a portable. We can monitor our patients. Uh, ultrasound, we uh, low power. You have to examine every area of course, the linear probe, especially the uh, the blue line, taking the really regular one. Okay, and examine all the areas. The most important is the fist, which is back. Okay, and the sixth one is lower and the back as well. And this will be the finding grading from A down D with increased severity down C with a consolidation. And if a patient non-critical, you will be observing the changes as we are telling in the inferior and posterior and the large number of B lines and sublunar pulmonary consolidation. Uh, specificity is not uh, so much, and sensitivity is almost our 75% and better in the ambulatory patients. For general approach, all imaging, all imaging modalities are non uh, And the imaging is only one bit of information, but being taken into clinical context in order to sum it all. Okay? Uh, clinically assessed upon the first point of check, chest X ray, ultrasound, suspected with the uh, uh, definition. Uh, we can send the CRB and uh, lymphopenia. Okay, do BCR. BCR coming positive. Okay, diagnosed, and this will go to the uh, pathway of uh, COVID disease. But the problem is negative BCR. Again, with low incidence of suspicious, okay, you can exclude. But still, you are suspecting too much. Keep isolation, protect yourself and to protect the patient, to protect the environment and go to the CT. CT consistent with COVID? Okay, COVID is possible. Keep your management and even start to treat. And repeat BCR within two days and if the patient permitted at any time, please do tracheal as well. And if it is not inconsistent, try to search for uh, another diagnosis. Okay, keep in your mind uh, when you are asking about symptomatology, dig more and more. There is some denial nowadays of our patients and even the relatives. Dig more and more. Give soft diarrhea. Ignore the first. Go again and ask your patient, please, uh, after some time. It is a syndrome of multiple systems of infection. It is not a disease. Multiple different presentations and the courses of illnesses. So cut the chain, early isolate, and the rapid diagnose suspected cases. All patients must be filtered carefully before ruling out. In order to win the battle, be prepared to protect and detect two diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Uh, so let's go to the next speaker. Uh, and our next speaker in this session is uh, talking about undifferentiated 
uh, shock with COVID-19, a very, very practical approach. Um, and when we are talking about the practical approach, it's really practical approach. We cannot say shock in 20, 25 minutes at all. It, 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 it would be very shocking uh, to give somebody this task. So our guest today is uh, Dr. Adel Hussein. He is uh, an athesia and critic care consultant. He is uh, coming from Sharif Mukhtar. Basically, he has an MD, PhD, and he's currently the director of critical care administration in King Abdullah Medical uh, City in uh, the holy capital, Saudi Arabia. So thanks for accepting our invitation, uh, Dr. Adel, and being with us here. And thanks again for taking this huge task on board, talking about shock in 25 minutes, including COVID-19. So again, this talk will be like very practical touch on what to do in particular with the COVID-19 and the mic with you, Prof. Adel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Jazakallah uh, khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashfaq Allah wa al-mursali Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. First of all, I have to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to be a speaker uh, tonight in this valuable uh, conference. Uh, as Dr. Walid uh, said, Dr. Walid, I'm okay with the voice? Yes, you're fantastic. That's very nice. Okay, fine. Uh, so I'm trying tonight just to be practical uh, from uh, the, the management point of view for uh, managing uh, a patient uh, COVID-19 presenting to you either in the ER or in the ICU with uh, the so-called term undifferentiated shock. Uh, first, I have no relevant relationship with any commercial or non-profit organizations. Why well, I'm here tonight, uh, this is the objective of my presentation today. I go just to highlight some pitfalls in the shock management. Then I will move to finding a way to evaluate the cause of uh, shock in crashing COVID-19. Number three, uh, I will uh, highlight uh, a very simplified uh, stabilizing approach. Then I will end by uh, some take home messages. Shock, as all we know, it's extraordinarily important. Why? Because it's generally a final common pathway before death. Most serious diseases are capable of causing shock Shock if left untreated, it will progress for sure to multiple failure and eventually, however, shock is often reversible and thereby avoiding death. Shock is about perfusion, not BB. It always assess for signs of acute in perfusion. Extremities out and minutes. There is no single sign, or symptom, or even lab, which is entirely sensitive for shock. Therefore, there is no single investigation to exclude shock. There is two common instruments we heard during the round, either to assess in the ER or during the statement that exclude shock. Again, both statements correct. Patient deservative shock may have a normal preparation, particularly if they have chronic hypertension from before. Diagnostic algorithms, all the literatures, internet, uh, text box, uh, smartphone, you have different algorithms. But again, I have to highlight this important point that the diagnostic algorithms for shock, like any diagnostic algorithm, work best among patients with single disease process were previously normal, but this is the work of shock. Unfortunately, many patients with multifactorial shock on an abnormal baseline, like reduce the shock fraction, the simple algorithms will fail these patients. Patients who have suffered uh, ROS uh, uh, or MI will often develop a post arrest or post MI shock. Why? Because of the so-called cytokine storm syndrome or systemic inflammation. This may lead to a confused and quite fast, or I can slow down. It really, it's okay, Dr. Adil, going on. 
Okay, so uh, the most common of shock of unclear etiology for most of us usually is septic shock. But remember, other causes should be carefully excluded prior to reach and preemptive or empiric diagnosis of septic shock. When you are uncertain whether uh, your patient has sepsis or not, just a step back behind, ask yourself how sick the patient is. Finally, don't forget to evaluate the archival data like all the AKGs, images, CT scans, why this may help to sort out the chronic pathology versus acute pathology. So moving now to the cause of shock in crashing uh, COVID-19. Before I'm going to the practical point of evaluation, just I will highlight a few uh, statistics about uh, the COVID-19 incidence for ICU admission and mortality. I think most of our colleagues, they highlighted, but just a reminder, that the reason for ICU admission in COVID-19, 60 to 70% you got admitted because of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. 20 to 30% you got admitted because of myocardial dysfunction, either MI or myocarditis. 44% you got admitted because of lethal arrhythmias. 10 to 30% because of acute kidney injury. Okay, what about endophysial shock? 30% you got admitted by, uh, because of uh, endophysial shock. Mortality rate in COVID-19, the recent literature, uh, still the disease or the break is new, but the mortality related to acute hypoxemic respiratory failure or acute respiratory failure, you know, this about 50%. Shock, mainly the fulminant myocarditis, 7%, both about one third, 30%, and still unclear mechanism uh, from uh, bleeding or hemorrhage or uh, other causes, still unclear, 7%. Who at risk for mortality? Usually the elderly, the multiple comorbidities, patients with high severity of illness scores, some high biomarkers trending up like high dimer or uh, CRP, leukopenia, or high NLR, neutrophil uh, lymphocyte ratio, and finally the secondary infection. What are the shock, shock rate relaxed? So usually when you, you have patient uh, uh, with shock or hypotension, there is some flag that this patient had an imminent shock. For hemodynamics, usually trends will usually be more fallible than abnormal uh, value. So please respect the trends. Hypotension, yes, there is numbers or significant drop from baseline. So MAP less than 65 and or significant drop from baseline. Uh, elevated shock index, uh, the shock index usually uh, we, we, we use it in the mass casualty or pre uh, intubation and rapid sequence intubation. A uh, very useful index, I will highlight it in the next slide, is usually a way to understand the tachycardia within the context of the blood pressure. What about the bradycardia? Usually for severe bradycardia, always raise the concern of shock. And even if the blood pressure maintained by the company vasoconstriction, Cardiac output and the systemic perfusion may still be poor. So, as I mentioned, this is the, the, the shock index. So, please respect the shock index, especially as a secondary triage tool in the mass casualty like the COVID 19. So, normally, the, 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 uh, the shock index uh, is below 0 0.7, 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. If more than one, this is a most specific predictor of hyperlactitemia and ICU mortality, when the eight days mortality. For uh, rapid sequence intubation, which we needed usually in uh, COVID-19 patient, if he's crashing or the intubation, usually we use uh, uh, RSI. So if the, uh, the shock index more than eight, so this is predict a post-intubation crash and you should put in mind. So the role of shock index is very important in COVID-19 crashing patients for post-intubation uh, hypotension, suspected sepsis, and of course the bleeding. Uh, what other shock red flags? Delirium. The new answer delirium is a sign of shock, but remember, it's neither specific, neither sensitive. And some authors, they said, if you have patient with delirium and shock, it go usually with septic rather than cardiogenic shock. What about urine output? So decreasing the urine output for oligoria below 0.5 cc per kg per hour is worrisome and reflects renal hypoperfusion. And remember also the scanty or dark urine also, it's worrisome. Uh, not only the urine output. Skin perfusion, yes, cold extremities, an early sign of vasoconstriction and reduced cardiac output. Skin modeling is less sensitive, but it's more specific for hypoperfusion and high mortality with different grades. As you show here in the slides, and our skin modeling, you, don't have, you have up to five grades of skin modeling. 
So this is a sen less sensitive, but it's more specific for hyperperfusion and high mortality, by the way. What about the capillary refill time? Capillary refill time changes during your shock transportation uh, for crashing patients were found to be significantly associated with uh, poor prognosis of high mortality. If you have the index uh, finger, capillary refill time uh, of uh, 2.4 or more, and for knee, capillary refill 4.9 seconds or more, this is a strong, it was found that a strong predictive factor or for 14 days uh, isomortality. Moving now to hemodynamic puzzle. We have in, in, in our use since long time, many hemodynamic monitoring system uh, from the static and from the dynamic uh, museum of the hemodynamic uh, system. Uh, we have labs, we have invasive, we have less invasive, but still, still with this puzzle, we have the missing link. So what hemodynamic tool will solve your, this, this puzzle? There's, it should be an accurate tool, should be non-invasive. You are managing a COVID-19 crashing patient, should be simple and cheap. It can be done anywhere, anytime. It should be quick and at the same time, reusable. So the question is, what do we expect from this hemodynamic monitoring system? The answer of three, it should measure accurately the cardiac output, the fluid responsiveness, and it should help you in the resuscitation endpoints. So now, how can we evaluate the cause of shock or hypotension in crash of COVID-19? This is the most valuable player in our game. And remember, less is more. Remember this word, less is more. You are managing COVID-19 crash of pain, less is more. So lab, as I mentioned before, can only suggest shock, but does not exclude. What about hyperlactitemia? Lactate more than 40, with a lot in some uh, uh, guidelines and protocols, it's a digital shock, but does not, it, it should, has a broad differential diagnosis for hyperlactitemia. Uh, uh, for high lactate, yes, it's, it's worrisome and should be interpreted to represent shock or some other impending disaster until proper, so you should respect it, yes. On the other hand, normal lactate is, is not necessarily reassuring. It can occur also with shock. What about central venous saturation? Sometimes we use it as a diagnostic test of systemic hyper hyperperfusion, but again, it's a, a poor correlation. Now we use it as one of parameters for uh, resuscitation in the point. But again, it, from the literature, it has a poor correlation. Okay, now why COVID-19 patients uh, should present uh, with undifferentiated shock or hypotension? The common four types can occur in COVID-19 patients. The common four types, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, obstructive, distorted. But the mechanisms, we should uh, know it by heart and we should put it in our differential diagnoses when we manage this patient. Why patient in COVID-19 should present with hypovolemic? Yes, he can present because those patients, they have anorexia, vomiting, and diarrhea. They can present be because of GI bleed, proteinia or retroproteinia. Why they should present those cardiogenic shock? Yes, they can present because of the nature of the disease. We do not, till, till today, uh, as of today, we didn't have clear picture about the pathogenesis of COVID, its, it's assumptions and theories. But those patients, uh, especially for, for cardiogenic shock, they can present because of MI, either type one or type two. Uh, type one, they this is with decompensated heart failure. They can present with myopericarditis, so uh, do not ignore the S-segment elevation as myopericarditis, and you should exhaust your workup to rule out uh, myopericarditis. Lethal arrhythmias can, co can present with cardiogenic shock. C uh, cytokine release syndrome, or so-called cytokine storm syndrome, and uh, finally, stress-induced cardiomyopathy or Takutsubo syndrome. So this is can precipitate cardiogenic shock. What about yeah, shock course, tamponade, common dose patient, we have a example of the hyper effect, pulmonary hypertension, acute pulmonary hypertension. Some patients, they have uh, spontaneous pneumothorax, especially if they have underlying lung problems like COPD or uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Distributive shock, yes, they can present commonly with distributive shock, secondary to cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm, or the so-called uh, fatal disease, we call it hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, 
also because of sepsis, secondary, secondary bacterial infection, and after post cardiac arrest, as I mentioned before, they have distributive type of shock. Okay, there is another two entities we have to put in mind, uh, plus four. Number one is the Mexic shock, Mexic type shock. So any, any patient of, of, of about four meters, say, they can present with mixed, like uh, cardiogenic, distributive, obstructive, hypovolemic. So it can present uh, uh, with mixed type shock. And for post intubation hypotension, yes, those patients at the risk of post intubation, if you decide to intubate them, those patients are at risk of post intubation hypotension. We can evaluate, as I mentioned, with the shock index. And the risk factor of this dispersion, they are volume depleted, the PEEP effect, and of course, the sedative effect. So, does one, one shock type exist in isolation? I will answer this. Patients with cardiogenic shock, post cardiac arrest, or massive bleeding may also suffer from distributive shock, as I mentioned, because of the systemic inflammatory response and the cytokine storm syndrome plus the visoplasia. They were reported about 50% of patients with septic shock will develop cardiac dysfunction, which is the stress-induced or uh, Takotsubo syndrome, or sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy or cardiac dysfunction. Patients with hypotension, severe heart failure, they may in fact initially volume responsive. Why? If they are suffering from concomitant GI fluid losses, overdiuresis, or occult bleeding, so they, they, they are in severe heart failure, but at the same time, they are fluid responsiveness. Okay, now moving to the stabilization approach. So please, when you face a patient with undifferentiated shock or hypotension, start systematic. Time is, is money, as we said, so now you have to be systematic and it is like a checklist. So if you have a checklist, you will never miss. Start uh, clinical, scan perfusion, then go for the monitor, start uh, look for, for narrowing your definition of the This is narrow pulse pressure uh, or wide pulse pressure hypotension. Uh, you have point of care ultrasound, and this is something non-invasive. It will help you as uh, echo assessment, lung ultrasound, and abdomen, uh, abdominal ultrasound, and we will see how it will help you as a point of care ultrasound. So here is the uh, very simplified approach. If you have a patient with hypotension, uh, COVID or non-COVID, but here, because my uh, core is the COVID-19. So if a COVID-19 patient had a hypotension, so you will start with your physical exam, so and the, the, the skin perfusion, the modeling, it will give you a clue. So the monitor is a type of arrhythmia tachy or pre-arrhythmia type, it will give you a clue. Then bring your ultrasound or point care of ultrasound for echo assessment, for IVC, so it will delineate or highlight what type of shock you are dealing with pump failure, obstructive shock, or hypovolemic shock. Do we have protocols in our pocket? Yes, we have point of care ultrasound protocols in and the future shock. So the first one, the common one we are applying since long time, this is in trauma or non-trauma patients, and it, it's applicable for uh, undifferentiated shock in COVID-19. Uh, this is called, I, I think all of you, you know about it, which is the rapid ultrasound and hypertension protocol. Uh, just I will write it in short, that you go to evaluate the three items or the three cores of this protocol, which is the pump, the tank, and pipes. Through the pump, you will evaluate with the different views if the patient uh, is in cardiogenic or in uh, 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 obstructive. For the tank, it will give you another clue if you assess the IVC or you go to for the, the, the uh, lung ultrasound or you go for the abdomen. If you go for the pipes, evaluating the vascular uh, tree, again, it will give you an impression. So with the RUSH protocol, remember you are going through the pump, the tank and pipes, it will give you an idea. Another protocol, uh, another protocol also with the use of point of, care, uh, point of care ultrasound, which is the false protocol, the fluid administration limited lung ultrasound protocol is a very useful one you can rely on. This is, we call it false responder or non-responder, usually when the patient present with a profile. I think I don't have time to go in details on this, but still, yes, it has a limitation, but with the false protocol, it can delineate you for your patient is hypovolemic or septic, for obstructive or cardiogenic, you go with the uh, profile type. Okay, now what type of, of hemodynamic parameters and tools usually we rely on the dynamic rather than uh, uh, static? But among the dynamic parameters, we have a long list. I will just choose for the COVID-19, 
the systolic pressure variation and passive degrees. Why? I don't need you to be uh, more invasive, not more sophisticated. Be less invasive, less sophisticated, time is money. So use commonly the base passive degrees and the systolic pressure uh, variation. So this is an example how we can manage COVID-19 patient just to, from the uh, uh, arterial waveform. This is how we can uh, calculate the pulse pressure variation with a very simple equation. Uh, and the outcome uh, or the target of 10 to 15 percent of pulse pressure variation, it predicts the likelihood of positive response in the cardiac output to fluid responses. So it will answer you. But again, it's still nothing is ideal. It will give you uh, some limitation, especially in mechanically ventilated patients. And you have to have a, a passive breathing uh, without spontaneous breathing. Should you should paralyze them or say deeply state them? And the patient should be uh, uh, should be in sign prison. Sensitivity of species quite reasonable. It's ninety percent. This is the passive uh, leg raise test. Usually we use it one uh, to three minutes. And this is the protocol how we use it: is a free fluid challenge or many fluid challenge. Uh, and uh, we use it usually the passive leg raise with the pulse pressure uh, variation or some uh, uh, ultrasound uh, tool or help to monitor the cardiac output and the other indices. So now when you go to assess the fluid responsiveness uh, regarding the tool, is it static or dynamic? It should be in your mind clearly. This tool should answer the RV status and LV status. You should have a full plumb picture on both sides. So for example, the IVC ultrasound, it gives you an idea only about the RV. CVB for most of us, but it give, does not reflect the LV. But pulse pressure variation, it reflects the LV for the upper load. But what about the fluid challenge? Do we have something near ideal? Yes. If you have many fluid challenge, PLR and echo, so you will, you, sorry, so you will have both RV and LV uh, uh, explanation. So if your patient, based on this uh, fluid responsive, if not, yes, you have to ask your, your the first question. Yes, if your patient is intubated or not, if he's intubated, normal synothrism, well paralyzed, so please go and use pulse pressure variation or systolic pressure uh, variation. If not, so ask yourself, can I assess or image the IVC? Yes or no? If yes, please go for assessment of the IVC and look for the diastolic collapse. If not, go for the mini challenge with the passive leg raise. I think this is uh, more simplified. So now I just will highlight you some hemodynamic management tips for my colleagues, especially uh, uh, the updated uh, uh, protocols now or updated guidelines, just I adopted from, from some of them. So remember, as I mentioned before, in the beginning of my presentation, less is more. COVID-19 patients hate celebrate fluid restriction. So please be restrictive and prudent with fluid administration. Use buffer or balanced crystalloids over unbalanced crystalloids. Oevolemia seems best, especially in uh, Gatanoni phenotype, which is the L phenotype. And please do not follow the lactobolus. I call it lactobolus because I, I found my colleagues rushing if the high lactate, I will give uh, fluids, either in the ICU or in the AR without looking with uh, the, the full flow. And remember, same fluid blanket does not fit all. Why? What about morbid obesity? Do you use the ideal body weight, the adjusted body weight, for example, for the sur uh, sepsis, uh, surviving sepsis campaign guideline, 30 ml per kg, if you have morbidly obese patient. So do you use the adjusted body weight? Do you use the actual body weight? What about the aneuric in the surgery and the disease? What about patient with massive PE and they have the usually dilated uh, RV? Be goal directed, please, with fluid administration. Use dynamic rather than static. Use change in the vital signs, PLR. L use less sophisticated tools. Use the point of care ultrasound. Do fluid challenges to avoid fluids when no benefit. And remember, the last word is not yet said dry and vasopressors. On the other hand, remember as well, many COVID-19 patients may develop AKI, a multi-organ failure, on vasopressor, when in fact they could benefit from some prudent, fluid, and wise administration. For the vasopressors, use the norepinephrine as a first line uh, vasoactive agent. Add vasopressin as a second line agent over titrating the norepinephrine when you could not reach the target map. 
Titanium vasoactive agent to target your map between 60 to not, do not be dogmatic to 65, be 60 to 65. In case you have cardiac dysfunction with persistent, with persistent hypoperfusion, use dobutamine over increasing norepinephrine dose alone. And for shock reversal steroids, use low dose corticosteroid, 50 milligram Q6, in case of shock and visibly needed. We call it shock reversal. Now, what about the, the need for central line? No need for central line at the beginning. If your patient have uh, uh, to, uh, to resuscitate him quickly, so you can use uh, vasopressor, and this is the recommendation. This is a COVID-19, don't waste your time for central line. So you can, this is from the literature. I adopt this from the current literature. So when to use the vasopressor in peripheral line, when the vasopressor are expected to be short. The CVC insertion is difficult or not visible. Waiting for CVC insertion may compromise your patient care. Where you put it? It's in the jugular for arm, upper arm. Avoid the anticubital fossa next to joints and EV fistula if the patient is, that is dependent. For how long you use it? Maximum of six hours. And this is what the literature said. And again, please bring the point of care ultrasound to confirm your vein diameter and to help you uh, to choose the best one more than five meter. And the minimum gauge should be 20 or uh, more. Now, you resuscitated your patient. Uh, for how long should you resuscitate? At the end, you should have resuscitation endpoints, starting from the assessment, ending up from recovery. So uh, it's not a single, it's a whole package. So there is no single endpoint, resuscitation endpoint you can rely on. So please, it's a collective package. Is it traditional or new? Yes. Acute or ongoing process, static or dynamic, global or in the organ. So you use clinical, mentation, skin perfusion, pulse, pressure, shock index I mentioned, urine output. On the other hand, you have some labs to help you, lactate, with the facet, point of care ultrasound, and cardiac output, and uh, uh, arterial waveform analysis, PP, uh, uh, PPAV, uh, the pulse pressure variation. So, but do not rely on a single one. Uh, remember the resuscitation endpoint is a process, it's a dynamic process, and never rely on single item of the recitation endpoint. So uh, to end uh, with my lecture, I will go uh, to two slides, just to take home messages from my, my recitation. And I apologize if I uh, uh, bath through uh, quickly or uh, for the long time presentation. The, for in COVID-19 crashing patients, be aware about the common shock bitfalls. Diagnostic algorithms for shock work best among patients with single disease process who were previously normal. Widen your differential diagnosis and do not miss mixed shock state. Really, it's not uncommon. Please put high index of suspicion in your mind for uh, cytokine release syndrome or the so-called cytokine storm syndrome, myopericarditis, and post-intubation hypotension. Not all S segment elevation is a STEMI. Respect the S segment elevation in the your differential as myopericarditis. Goal of resuscitation is to maximize, to maximize survival and minimize morbidity using both objective hemodynamic and physiologic value, values to guide your therapy. Remember, the first few hours are vital in managing crashing COVID-19 patients. Again, be goal directed with fluid resuscitation using dynamic less sophisticated, simple, cheap, passively grace, mini flow challenge, change in your vitals, IVC dynamics, and echocardiography. Remember also, there is no therapeutic endpoint is universally effective. It's a package, not single. Lastly, but not the least, remember very well, less is more. If you're gonna uh, go out from this presentation, just the last one, less is more, and the same fluid blanket does not fit all, and please be prudent with fluid administration. Stay safe, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, um, uh, Dr. Adil, and thanks for all our speakers in this uh, session. So I will ask one quick question for Dr. Adil Hussain, then I'll ask uh, help for uh, my colleague uh, in the, uh, the other moderators, Dr. Ahmed Fouad, Dr. Mohamed Gindi, uh, and Dr. Prof. Mohamed Ibrahim, if you wanna ask just one question to one of our um, uh, guest speakers today. But during this time and during answering my question, I will put the poll on so to make to maximize the share. So we leave it for longer time. So the poll is currently on in your screens. So you can just listen to our uh, questions and do the polls in the same time. 
So uh, to travel, uh, everybody knows I'm like really keen to do uh, the ultrasound and echocardiography for all the patients because it helps us to see what's happening and complete that missed piece of the puzzle. But do you think in, when we're dealing with crisis management, do we have the real facility to echo or ultrasound every patient in, uh, in the, the COVID crisis? Or we have different pathways to depend more on our clinical rather than any other investigation like echo and ultrasound. Particularly, this may increase the infection risk with the COVID if we are rushing in the crisis management situation. Thank you. Thank you, Roid. Uh, I agree totally with you. So this is, I was just trying to be uh, uh, practical, uh, less sophisticated. Why we are relying on uh, ultrasound, usually because it's, uh, uh, as you said, if we are dedicating some uh, machines mainly for uh, cohorted COVID-19, and this is what we are doing in our hospital, and after each use, we are uh, uh, disinfecting uh, probably, either with paternal aluminum or we have a certain protocol for disinfection, but again, we dedicated for cohorting those patients. This is number one. Number two, as you mentioned, and you are one of the expertise in the uh, point of care ultrasound, it helps a lot, especially if you use uh, a peripheral line for visipressor, as I mentioned, so it will help a lot uh, for identifying the uh, vein caliber, and it will save your time uh, before rushing to uh, central line. Uh, second, it, it's, it's a part of resuscitation endpoints to give loads or not, the, the debate of every day to those type, especially the L and H phenotype, still uh, the discrimination is still quite a pathological part rather than a clinical part. So I agree with you, but again, uh, we have to be more, we are a clinician at the end. You have to be uh, uh, broadened when you have the, the tool in your hand. But my message is don't, don't go invasive, don't waste your time. The patient will not wait for you. Perfect. That's it. So I think the, the message is clear enough for most of us here. So we are like bedside clinicians, not echo or ultrasound technicians. If we need something like it's it's, it's like clear message. Uh, if you have yes or no answer to one question and the, the cornerstone in this answer will be the ultrasound, okay, go for it. Otherwise, like use the strategy of crisis management situation. Thanks Agreed. so much. Uh, so uh, Dr. Ahmad Madi, do you have a question here? Yes, thank you so much. Actually, uh, I uh, just a very small question for Dr. Sena, if you never mind. Thank you for very, uh, actually, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I want to ask about the availability of the uh, RGG and IgM tested in Egypt. This is the first one. Second, uh, actually, this one from the audience. He did ask about does PCR, does CT chest can replacing the PCR in early diagnosis of the patient with COVID 19? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, uh, what we have is uh, uh, the rabbit test. The rabbit test is a uh, uh, technique that uh, is giving uh, the antibody, either IgG uh, and IgM, in 15 minutes. Um, of course, uh, all this telling about is not uh, sensitive, not uh, uh, specific like uh, PCR. Uh, but it gives uh, a crude idea in some cases. Uh, especially if negative uh, BCR, and you are uh, thinking of uh, that the patient was the uh, infection and getting immune. And we know uh, uh, several uh, colleagues that tested uh, for Imperist, and they found that they are IgM positive. Uh, and of course, they are uh, BCR uh, negative. For uh, those cases, uh, still we are going, but not like BCR, still, the diagnosis by PCR is still the golden standard uh, in Egypt till this moment. Uh, second uh, question, uh, please, you are returning what uh, question? The second one, they asked about, uh, about the CT, sensitivity of the CT in comparison to the PCR. You want to ask, does we can, we can keep CT uh, for diagnosis of COVID-19 uh, if we don't have uh, PCR? Uh, initially, initially, uh, th th this uh, was uh, something like a routine in some uh, hospitals in Egypt. Uh, this is telling that uh, before a patient to, to go inside the hospital to do CT. 
And this because uh, the characteristic findings, especially this ground glass appearance. However, when the radiologists uh, go on the line, they are telling we have uh, several differential diagnoses. But actually, CT is a very good sensitive, uh, even before uh, the clinical manifestation of the patient, and it's reaching up to 90%. But all the studies uh, coming from the radiologist against using it as a routine. But uh, as uh, Dr. Adil is telling, we are clinicians at the end. We have to put all together, okay? Nothing clinical, radiology, with, of course, uh, uh, screening with X-ray and ultrasound, and CT is very important in this issue. And it is in the panel that if PCR is negative, go for CT, especially if you are thinking for another diagnosis like pulmonary embolism. We, we had one case. Uh, uh, 24 years old, presented with acute respiratory stress and the SVT, uh, and uh, reverted, and they are thinking of pulmonary embolism. So these are findings of ground class appearance. It might help to deviate the diagnosis, but not to be a routine one. Believe in clinical, believe in uh, uh, imaging primarily, then uh, CT will help you uh, in such a condition. Thank you. Uh, do you have any more questions? Thank you so much for the, our guest speakers, actually. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hisham, uh, Dr. Adil, and Dr. Sama for being with us. And uh, I'd like, uh, in continuation of the clinical management of the patient with COVID-19 patient, I actually would like to be with you in upcoming session for uh, 